Well, good morning. It's a bit awe-inspiring to see so many of you here on a Saturday morning. What do I have to tell you about the university? Well, I'm going to start and finish with the same statement. You have got every right to be proud of being members, because you still are. This is your university. It's at the top of the tree. It's the best university in the UK, certainly in Europe, and some of us would argue in the world as well. And we've been able to sustain that position of academic excellence despite all the furores and changes in government and government funding and all of the other areas. And that is a testimony and tribute to the Collegiate University of Cambridge. This university has not and never will, certainly while I'm here, compromise on the major issues of quality and excellence that have to underline everything that we do. And that stems from something which is a statement I normally hate. I hate the concept of mission statements. God knows I've read enough of them, um, and you've seen them. But Cambridge's is the shortest I've ever come across. And boy, is it to the point. It's very typically Cambridge. To serve society through teaching, learning, and research at the highest international standards of excellence. And from that, I'm just going to pick out three words. Quality, international, and society. Quality is a very difficult phenomenon to judge. How do we actually say what is quality? I'm going to return to that business that Charles Dickens wrote about, uh, how do you define a horse? Um, the bottom line is, for most of us who have been in the academic world, quality speaks for itself. And sometimes it's very difficult to make quality a totally observable, objective set of measures. We use them where they work, but we always add the subjective element to be able to make judgments about people, because that is the business that we have to be in as a collegiate university. And in fact, I would go so far as to say the colleges lead in this area. The second is international. Now, I have to be careful what I say, so hands up any reporters in the room. No? Good. I'm frankly not that interested in any United Kingdom university. Even our very dear friends, and I do mean that, that is not being sarcastic in the Cotswolds. <laughs> the, the issue for Cambridge is we set our standards to make sure we can compete with the Harvards, the Princetons, the MITs, the Stanfords, as well as Oxford and uh, other institutions in Britain. Britain is inordinately lucky that it actually has so many institutions that are valued globally because these judgments are made globally because, frankly, for investments that come from government in this sector, they don't deserve it. But we do so because of the absolute commitment of individuals. So what is society? You know, when this place started in 1209, it was probably you know, society probably went no further than Ely, I suspect. And as long as you kept the bishop happy, you probably were all right here as an academic. Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, the research assessment exercise or its successor ref. We didn't have national league tables every other week. We didn't have uh, uh, scrutiny by this body or that body. So it was maybe quite an easy idea to define what the society was that you tried to, to work to. Cambridge's leadership basically was to provide top quality administrators for the government with the royal prerogative and for the church. Firstly the Catholic Church, then the Church of England. That was where we were for centuries because those were the opinion formers and leaders of the time. That gradually changed to a major national role, particularly in the 19th century <clears throat> and in the 20th century and the 21st century. Society is no longer bounded. It is, frankly, the whole world. Our collaborations and engagements span the whole globe. I'll give you two examples. I would use the terminology six continents. You might not be aware, but I really mean that because we even have outposts in Antarctica that are actually working very hard on glacial uh, movements on that continent. But in India, your university is engaged in 270 active projects in India. 
not because I've told them to, not because the university has instructed, but because academics recognize equivalence in excellence in researchers in that subcontinent and want to work with them. Now, why do we do that? We do it because, as a university, we want to be part of solutions to global problems. No academic in this institution is going to be interested totally in the minutiae of, of some area. My own work was in two proteins on a virus. But it's led to understanding and developing vaccines for cervical cancer. We all look to what we can do to give back to society. On the research side, this is very clearly the position that George Porter took as president of the Royal Society when he defined research as only two types of research. There's applied research and not yet applied research. <laughs> In other words, the only reason string theory isn't being used or applied is because we're not smart enough to apply it yet. But I'm willing to bet somewhere in this institution there is a young person already thinking about how string theory can be applied. Um, probably working for GCHQ, but that's another matter. <laughs> another issue where we contribute and where the collegiate university will and will always play a part in this institution is in the role of education. I've talked about research, I've talked about the great challenges that the university will address in the future uh, and how we will stand up to, to that plate and probably those will dictate where we stand in global league tables, whatever those might actually mean in the long term. But the fundamental issue is how good are we at educating the next generations, providing the next generation of leaders uh, for this country, for Europe, I'd go so far as to say, and in the world of tomorrow. Now, you might be surprised, but despite all the vicissitudes of politics, fees, uh, debt, and all of the other areas, your university last year attracted more uh, applications from undergraduate students than in the whole history of the University of Cambridge. There were 17,500 applications. Oh, the colleges, through the admissions offices and tutors, and I know here as well, conducted 24,000 interviews. Ponder that for a second. For 3,500 places, every candidate being interviewed twice. And if anyone ever tells me that colleges do not have a role in the 21st century, believe me, I do not intend for the university to get involved in 24,000 interviews. That is Carol's problem. And the colleges do incredibly well and work closely with the university. I work with the senior tutors day in, day out, and I'm absolutely flabbergasted at the time and effort they put in. But colleges are completely underestimated in so many ways. We're undergoing some major changes in the way education will be delivered. I cannot tell you whether these corridors will be full of students in 50 years' time. They may all be sitting at computer terminals um, elsewhere, coordinated from buildings such as this. But I'll tell you one thing. If the, anyone thinks the colleges weren't uh, relevant, we're living in a world where personalised education is going to be as important as personalised health. There are a plethora of ways you can get information, but I don't think there are a plethora of ways you can get education. And it's this one-to-one -one or small group teaching that is going to be at the heart of what Cambridge is going to be delivering over the next 50 years. So on the 1st of October, I said something that I think many of the colleges actually did appreciate, which is if we didn't have colleges today, I would be driving the agenda to create the colleges for tomorrow. Possibly they're more relevant now than in the whole of the 800 his year history of the university. And we're very, very lucky to have them here. I say that with some feeling because while I was a deputy head at Imperial College, I wrote a paper for Imperial College, the creation of a collegiate system for Imperial College. It doesn't work there because of commute times, but it just shows you that others really look hard at this brilliant system that we have here. So the education agenda is well set, and the undergraduate agenda is set. But I also say a huge thank you to what the colleges are doing. 
with the colleges, we took a strategic decision, and I'm very happy to debate with you why we've taken that particular decision, that the future expansion of students in this university has to be a 2% year-on-year growth in our postgraduate student numbers while keeping the undergraduate numbers stable. The colleges, without any pressure from me, have just stepped up to the mark. They've created the space. They've made sure we get the supervisions for postgraduate tutors. They've done this because they believe this is part of our joint mission to build into the future. So I often get this crazy question. I get asked around the world, how on earth can you work with 31 independent colleges? My retort is we are lucky because with leaders like Carol, I've got 31 incredible influential opinion formers going out there and telling the world that Cambridge University is great and the college is fantastic as well. And that's the strength of the university and the collegiate university going forward. Where do we go from here as a university? I'm going to pick on three areas. Growth. The second is going to be internationalizing our offering and how do we actually become more and more relevant to an international society and thirdly, the maintenance of quality. The first, in terms of growth, is a very real issue for us. It's tied to the finances of the university, and I'm very happy to go into details and questions over points that some of you may want to raise. But let me disabuse you that we are a poor university. Our endowment with the colleges and the university is the sixth largest in the world. We're about to overtake MIT in terms of its endowment. Unfortunately, the next ahead of us is Yale, and that's going to take six or seven vice-chancellors before we catch <laughs> them up. So we're going to do as well as we can. That gives us freedom. No institution I've worked at has the possibility of deciding and maintaining its own autonomy. But with autonomy comes an incredible amount of responsibility that we owe to the taxpayer, to the community, and to others to make sure we use that autonomy wisely. It's a big challenge. And that sense of responsibility was the theme that I wanted to bring out in my speech this year. The opportunity of autonomy allows us to make a set of decisions as a collegiate university where we want to go and we can grow in directions and dimensions that can make sure that we control that rate of growth. Grow we must because we to remain competitive and to be able to attract the top people around the world we have to provide the very best facilities for those individuals to come for, to. You know this year um, I've been able to look at growth in, I'll give you two examples, the first is Cambridge's involvement in the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, many of you will not know what the Square Kilometre Array is, and to be honest with you, neither did I, until the physicists came to talk to me about it. This is the global radio astronomy project that is building a square kilometre of antennae in South Africa and Australia to measure radio signals from the deepest parts of the galaxy and the universe, telling us where we came from, possibly where we're even going to in the long term. But what terrified me is that Cambridge is going to be the centre handling all the data coming from this. That might not mean much to you, but if I tell you, you take all the global internet traffic coming through the internet today, then 60% of it will be funnelled through Cambridge in a year's time. God knows what it will do to our emails, but uh, uh, <laughs> never know, uh, knowingly gives you some idea of how much of the cutting edge of the technology as to how to handle this sort of material Cambridge is absolutely involved in. And that is a global project. And the second example I would give you as to why growth matters has been CRASH, situated just over there. The Centre for Research into the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, possibly most of you have never heard of it. It started off as six projects which grew, which Alison was able to grow into a new building called the Alison Richard Building on that site of interdisciplinary working by those doing research in the arts and humanities. 
This year they have 229 active projects around the world researching not in the sciences but in the arts and humanities and social sciences. Projects such as a major European analysis of the Indian elections in Rajasthan at one end to how do you build <coughs> houses that are effective to withstand major earthquake shocks uh, in uh, that area and other programs as to how to understand in Trinidad and Tobago the ethnic differences in a community which is built up of people who are all imports from other parts of the world. These are really important questions, so it's not just science, but that has grown and we've got to grow the accommodation to enable the ambitions of our individual investigators to be met. And so we're building Northwest Cambridge, um, a one billion pound investment. That's bigger than any project, any university in the UK, probably or Europe, is actually funding anywhere, which will create about 5,000 new places for postgraduates and postdocs so that they do not, we do not fall into the London trap of commute times of an hour or more for postgrads to actually get to their place of work. It's good they can be part of the city and integrated into the city, integrated with their colleges in making sure that they play a real part in the community of Cambridge. And that's just one example. So lastly, let me turn a little to society. Serving society. How do we do it? We serve society, <coughs> I would argue, in virtually everything that we do. At its most mundane, I have conversations with George Osborne and Ed Balls and all of uh, these other people. But did you know that Cambridge is the model for the whole of the European Union and we are deemed the most successful centre anywhere in Europe and for that matter, in a set of articles published not by ourselves but by MIT, reckoned globally to be the best place in the world to do business. It's not that Cambridge controls anything that we do, but we do it because we create a network. We give academics freedom to choose how they exploit. What I did point out to George Osborne was that we have 1,600 companies have been created in this region you're only talking about a population of 600,000 people, 1,600 companies. They've created 58,000 jobs for people in our local community. And they all work on Cambridge University know-how. I don't make a big profit to the university, by the way, of this coming in, but the government does. They brought in last year into the Exchequer 13.4 billion. What does that mean to you? If I just tell you Rolls-Royce in the same period brought in 12.1 billion, you can imagine a conversation which is, dear Chancellor, please remember, you may think we're only a small place in the Fens, but actually we're just as important as Rolls-Royce to the British economy. And that's something we should be proud of because people will be able to have new medicines, new technologies and new ideas being brought to them earlier. But we also have a role that our undergraduates and the colleges that inspire them, have a role to lead in the world of tomorrow. Leadership is a rather quaint and at times old-fashioned concept, but we need in this world, with all the problems that we're facing, leaders for tomorrow. And our students take on those leadership roles with alacrity to be able to take things on in the future. I'm going to return to the international agenda. In a, uh, an area of food security, let me just put in stark terms the problem that the planet faces. In 30 years' time, there will be 2 billion more people on this planet. That translates, in a world that I would understand, to a 40% increase that is going to be required in arable crops to deliver enough food to feed that population. Let me just leave you with the urgency of the problem that politicians don't sometimes think about when they've put their mindset to a four-year electoral cycle. What it actually means to an experimenter like myself, in the temperate climates, that gives us 30 growing seasons, three zero. It has taken 8,000 years to achieve the last 40% improvement in crop productivity. 
and we've got to do it in 30 years. Or in my language, that means 30 three zero experiments. I can tell you there is nothing I have ever done in my life, frankly, nor any scientist here, that just in 30 experiments they were able to deliver a 40% improvement in crops. And if we don't do it, and we don't change policies around the world, then people are going to starve. And to me, nothing underlines the responsibility that our students have as leaders to make those views known, make people aware that we are prepared to take on the really great challenges the world faces not by total competitiveness and claiming that Cambridge can solve the world's problems, but by working with other great institutions to try to make a difference. And if one word summarizes Cambridge, is Cambridge, through its teaching, learning, and research, makes a difference. It transforms tomorrows for ordinary people on this planet. And that I'm incredibly proud of, and I'm very proud of a collegiate system that can actually deliver this. Now, no Vice Chancellor's speech would be complete without telling you that uh, financially we would require all the support that you're able to give. Uh, I mean, let's be honest, that's, uh, th that's part of my job. But you know what? I don't have a problem with it because out there, the message I'm trying to give to people, to companies, to uh, governments, to major funding agencies, so you know what, we've actually got the track record that you can trust that we can actually do it. And that's quite different from some of the claims made by many others. They haven't got that 800 year old track record. And frankly, they haven't got the colleges that can help build that community of leaders that is going to be necessary for tomorrow. So please be very, very proud of the university, of your college, and of the contribution that all the scholars and students and staff of this university make to tomorrow. Be proud of it. And if I ask you for one thing, and no, this doesn't come with a blank check and please sign here, this comes, to, do you know how you can best help the university? Tell your friends about it, that you're proud to have been graduates of Cambridge and of Newnham, and that as a result, this university can make a difference. And tell them something else, and this might be difficult for some of you, but the students here now are certainly brighter than I ever was. Um, <laughs> and they are staggeringly uh, worthwhile in that investment because they will be the people who will have to make the difference. Thank you very much. <laughs>